Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford, and when I'm not doing this podcast, I'm probably writing something about training or nutrition or running or biking, or hopefully I am outside doing any of those things. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a registered kinesiologist and an endurance coach, and I'm Molly's co-host here on The Consummate Athlete. So here on The Consummate Athlete, for new listeners, we talk about all different types of sport, all different types of training. Uh, We talk to world-class athletes. We talk to world-class coaches and scientists and experts and really dive into, you know, how each sport breaks down, you know, how to train for it. We talk a lot about endurance sport, I'll be honest, but we've occasionally had, you know, NASCAR racers, NFL players, and soccer players join us on the show. Yeah, and what we really try and do is pull out some of the common themes in in performance and in sort of moving in a healthy, happy sort of fashion. Um, Happy being sort of the keyword for today's podcast. Yeah, that's right. Today's guest is David Roche. He is a running coach, mainly, I'm going to say, specializing in ultra runners. He's also the author of the new book, The Happy Runner. Um, When this comes out, it's actually going to be right around when I say that The Happy Runner is also going to be the athletic bookworm book of the month for the Outdoor Edit, my site, where we have a pretty nerdy athlete book club. So I guess you're you're getting maybe a, a bit of a jump on the readership of that site if you start reading it now super fun book all about sort of the the mindset and mindfulness that makes for a happy healthy and honestly faster runner so david talks about a bunch about that today his running philosophy some training specific stuff and it's honestly one of my favorite most positive conversations that i think i've ever had yeah, he's a really, really positive guy, and I think authentic too. I mean, you've been working with David now for a while, and he's had great success as a coach as well. Um, so I found it really motivating as a, a coach as well to, you know, the benefits and of bringing enthusiasm, I guess, right, to to people's lives and and just that constant reminder, right? It's very easy to get sort of caught down in all the numbers and things like that. Um, but yeah, it was is really, really good podcast. I think we both came away feeling better and then hopefully you, the listener, will also, no matter whether you're an athlete, a runner or not a runner, uh, or if you are a coach. Yeah. And I mean, I'd say I'd kind of challenge everybody to maybe take something from this and do something super positive today, whether it's, you know, high-fiving your friend at the end of your run or, you know, giving your spouse an extra hug or your dog an extra snuggle. I think David would approve of all three of those things. Um, But without further ado, let's get in. Uh, Enjoy this episode with David Roche. And if I'm in an elevator telling people what I do, which was the the question, um, I would say I primarily cuddle with a dog while being on my computer. Um, But that is less important probably to the people listening than what I'm doing when I'm on the computer, which is um, primarily coaching and writing. And so my wife, Megan, and I, who's a Stanford-educated doctor and the brains of the operation, coach a bunch of athletes, um, you know, from pros to people just getting started under the concept of really embracing long-term process and growth over time with the idea that we don't care about a person's race results or where, where the process actually leads. All we care about is them finding their contentedness along that way, their fulfillment, which can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, But yeah, so that's us. And I'm really excited to be on. That's awesome. And I I have to say the two of you sort of like have embodied, like I I was always a wannabe lawyer and doctor, and I never went down those (laughs) paths, which um, I I probably I sort of went directly to coaching. um, And maybe someday I'll end up at med school. But uh, who knows, but I have to say, there's like this part of me that's just like, I guess, jealous or nothing else I'll say um, of all that (laughs) intelligence and and schooling that you two have. You're jealous of that. I'm jealous of the dog. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I think you made the right decision to at least avoid law school. And when it comes to med school, um, you know, it's a lot and it kind of never ends. Um, so, you know, Megan has stepped off that path, um, just as I have with lawyer, but I feel like a lawyer stepping off the path is a little bit less interesting than a, uh, a doctor. So, um, I think you're, you're touching a lot of lives doing what you do. 
So, well, yeah. and I think, and I, I think it's, dog, like, uh, I totally, yeah, <laughs> she's definitely to be envied. Well, and the dog, I, I, I have to say, I really love everything you're seeing. The dog with Molly's very heavily, uh, and she tries to get every guest we have, I think, on her team for, for us to get a dog. It's working um, really well. <laughs> so I, she's like, okay, we're going to have David on, and so we have your book and stuff, and we're uh, going through it. I'm like, oh, I see where this is going right away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm, a, I'm, a Trojan, I'm a Trojan dog, like exactly. a Trojan horse, but per dog. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute! Is that a dog typing all of this? This yeah. is all engineered. Yeah, he got. He, <laughs> Peter was very like iffy about the dog being a co-author, but then he got to the "I'm not born to run, I'm born to love" quote, and At he actually least, read it out loud to me. There's tears in my eyes. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh my god! Molly's getting a dog. Yeah. <laughs> we have we have learned that uh, not everyone likes dogs, but that's a good life lesson too. So, like you know, part of the part of the uh, message of our book is, uh, and yeah, we just wrote about um, part of the message of it is this idea of, you know, trying to as much as you can with given the context of your brain chemistry, live like a puppy. And what that doesn't, that doesn't mean like the simplistic, just, Oh, I love everything all the time, just because you don't think about it. But trying to get to that point after thinking deeply about it and understanding the complexity of the world and people and how much things suck sometimes and all of that. So um, with that in mind, we were like, well, Hattie is a perfect co-author. Um, actually, in the very first draft of the book, our dog you know, wasn't really a part of it because we were worried about people not loving dogs. And we gave it to someone we coach. We've coached this person for a few years. They understand a little bit more about like what we're trying to get and all like pretty much they gave some grammatical feedback, but main, their main feedback was just, it's great, but where is Addy dog? <laughs> um, so the, the second version of it, you know, we probably could have used heavier editing, but the second edit was basically all Addy adding her commentary into the book. Um, so yeah, it's, it's some people have liked it and some have uh, actually a very recent, I had, um, did the thing you're not supposed to do and read a review no. and there was, there was yeah yeah but there was actually a good review a five-star review that just finished with could have used uh, or could have lived without all of the dog talk and it's like okay that's still good <laughs> <laughs> well that person is a monster so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that person probably should be on a watch list of yeah, some type. Exactly. they might not be able to fly on air they shouldn't fly on airplane it might have been a cat to be honest yeah <laughs> Oh my God, that is probably what it is. An underground cat army that is sent to yep. to undermine yep. us. Yeah, exactly. Um, speaking of the book, The Happy Runner, I love that it starts with a discussion of our own mortality. Um, big topic, <laughs> dark topic for a book called The Happy Runner. So how did you decide to, to open with that just, you know, light reading? <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah, so... Basically, I think it helps to zoom back to like how this book even happened. So we were approached by a publisher and asked to write a running book, essentially. And I think that that was primarily based on like the success of our athletes rather than anything that, um, you know, we had done to earn anything. Um, And so we said, sure. And we sent like a a two paragraph thing about like a running book. And um, our, our hope the whole time was to try to be able to kind of getting back to the Trojan horse concept, um, use running to talk about things that we saw through coaching were way more important than like the nuts and bolts of training methodology. And so what we did is we started writing. And so the first half of the book, which is primarily on the like more philosophical end, the kind of, you know, get stoned with your friends and talk about philosophy end, Mm -hmm. um, it took shape without the publisher necessarily signing off on it and so we had the first line of the book which was about you know for those listening i promise it's mostly a joke but the first line of the uh book is every runner has the same finish line yes um which probably needs like an ominous gong after you say it or something but then it comes with jokes and so uh we had that first line that's kind of before we even had the rest of the book because we really wanted to emphasize the point that happy does not come from a place of simplicity because if it does um one it can be dismissed really easily but two it won't stand up to like all the crap that life throws at you we wanted it to start from the place of ultimate complexity um so no matter what someone's spiritual grounding is that concept is something that you know we're all reckoning with whether even like your worst enemies and so we wanted to draw it back so 
long story short, we sent in the first half of the book. And I think we got lucky that our uh, the acquisitions editor at the publisher was such a big fan because we gathered that they, uh, they weren't getting exactly what they planned for um, with the, all the mortality and other discussion. But um, fortunately, she insulated us from all the arguments probably at the publisher. And I think that they're happy now. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's not your traditional running book, that's for sure. Um, but I mean, it's it's kind of amazing as I go through it, all of the, you know, super, super pro runners that you're working with and their stories and how so much of it is much more like mental shifting than, you know, major training shifts. Yeah, I mean, and I think any coach probably identifies with this over time. That's I think that's probably why, like, a lot of coaches in a lot of different sports kind of end up being these Zen-like figures, Um, whether you're talking about Steve Kerr, Greg Popovich in basketball, Phil Jackson in the old days in basketball, um, Joe Madden in baseball for the Cubs, like essentially, and then, you know, every running coach, because running is all between the ears, sees that over time, like what growth actually entails is this day-to-day commitment to this process that is all about long-term gratification. So, you know, that short-term things need to structure that. But, you know, you're you're not going to get through it unless you're in a place that you actually derive some sort of meaning or purpose from it that has to go deeper than, you know, scratching an itch, you know, like some some or like sexual, you know, like sexual conquest or something, something that's like immediate and control or power based. It needs to be something more pure and kind and all this other positive things that can motivate us over years. And um, yeah, so that was kind of what we saw with coaching. Like what we saw initially, you know, this was never the plan to be coaches. We were, I was a lawyer, I was practicing, Megan was a doctor. And, you know, behind the scenes, we saw that everyone was dealing with similar things. I mean, everyone has their own problems, but of similar, of similar hues, you know, like different shades, similar hues. Um, And yeah, it was just eye opening to us that, um, you know, every athlete is just at the, like, the tip of the iceberg of what they can accomplish over time. And so how do you, how do you get all those other things? It takes years of work and how do you get years of work? I mean, there has to be something that's, you know, positive and enduring driving that process because everything else burns out and burns you out over time. Mm -hmm. Okay. You just listed so many sports analogies that I feel like (laughs) I've never heard a runner or a cyclist ever be able to say, um, so I want to go back. You didn't start as a runner. You started as a football player, correct? <laughs> yeah, that's probably, uh, you know, a testament to how poor my college football team was. But, um, but yeah, so <laughs> I played football and baseball in high school and, um, and then went to college to play those sports. And so, yeah, a funny story. Um, my wife and I just went back to my high school and this is the first time I, I grew up in a very rural place never went back after I graduated. Um, so, uh, you know, grew up on a farm and we went back because I was, um, inducted into the high school hall of fame, which is so funny because I get up there and it's on homecoming and there's like thousands of people in the stands that there are in small towns. And the football team hears that, you know, there were people announced, for, there's a, like a woman not announced for soccer and then a man for lacrosse. And then I get up there for football. And I think the whole football team was like, that is so embarrassing. <laughs> you know, now I look like a runner. Um, and yeah, I mean, it probably, it's probably a testament also to how far the, uh, the sports come and where we grew up. But, um, but yeah, so I went to college to play those sports and then very rapidly realized that it wasn't for me. Um, and it, basically from there, I got into cycling because my dad had always been a biker when I was growing up. Um, he, you know, didn't really start till later, but then rode, you know, cat one, um, most of my childhood. So I, you know, a lot of my earliest memories were at him at races and things, Matt, well, this is something I can channel myself to. So I was a 205 pound, you know, five ten guy, like just pulling on the pedal, like, or having no idea what I was doing, but like, you can imagine me gripping the handlebars and like almost ripping them in half. Um, and now, and then, so yeah, gradually I just, followed the endurance athlete path and very slowly started to realize like what it took, you know? Um, mainly the first thing I realized is that I'm not a good enough bike handler to bike race. 
because I almost killed myself many times over. Um, and then also just understanding what it takes about like learning to go easy and being kind to your body rather than trying to tear it down and all these other principles that ended up being really important. And then the other most important thing about that is that, and it goes to my wife, Megan too. So she was a field hockey player at Duke. And so we both didn't come from a background where things were self-evident and made total sense. Um, or, and we didn't have the background of all the running economy development from these other things. So it was kind of the perfect storm, I think, in a lot of different ways to develop a coach. Though at the time I didn't realize it. I thought it was just the perfect way, perfect storm to, um, develop someone that really fears uphill. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was kind of how we got where we are. And that's good. And the philosophy though, that you've developed is very much like you say around this feeling and this this why really right and this concept of the why seems to keep coming up in our podcast and also with some of the guests we've had um so i'm wondering if you could step us a bit through sort of the process and i know this is jumping ahead a bit in the book certainly you lay it out um well uh but there you sort of have a, a process or a, a few questions that people can ask sort of when they're thinking about why they run um, i'm wondering if you could take us through that yeah well i think First, it's essential to understand the whole concept of why it doesn't just apply to running. It literally applies to everything in your life. Like, um, I think it's really easy in life to kind of stay on whatever assembly line you're on without asking that question. But it's not – that question doesn't have an obvious answer for almost anything we do. No, it's very um, nebulous, you know, right? It's, it's overwhelming for some people. Mm-hmm. For everyone. Yeah. Well, it especially applies to, like, profession and things like that. Um, you know, I think it's, it's helpful for people to think about that because a lot of what we assume our why answers are, are not actually our answers. They're answers from, you know, maybe societal, societal pressures, family, um, you know, an under or, or a lack of the whole perspective of existence and mortality, like all these different things that once you dr- drill things down to their core, it's really hard to answer that why question. I think the best probably example of that is we've all dealt with the, you know, children, like what is it, like two or three years old where children start asking why. Um, And so they'll ask you a why for something. And then they'll ask you why about that why, about the answer. And eventually you get to a point where it's almost always, well, because of evolution and this stars blew up. And, you know, like no matter what the question is, even if it's like, why do we watch TV or something? Um, And so that, point, though, is really important for adults to think about, too, that once you drill down to the basics, why has to come from these big overarching ideas, or it won't endure when it faces adversity. So what we like athletes to do is to really summarize it in in, um, a, a little bit shorter, is to have a why that is internal, so not based on external validation. If no one knew what you were doing, would you still do it? That sort of thing. Um, and it's positive. Um, is this the type of thing that you are happy about your, or, or something that you like about yourself? Is this something you want to support? Because the negative things can be extremely powerful, but they're never cured by athletics. And it often it only burns people out. Like I like to use the Darth Vader example that the dark side is extremely powerful, but it also can kind of turn you into like a version of yourself you don't love over time. Um, and some other Star Wars analogies, and I'm sure I don't want to butcher because I feel like that would be the best way to get people to hate me is messing up a Star Wars analogy. So, um, yeah, so positive and in- internal are the main two things. And then within that, like, ask yourself con- questions about, like, not just why do you run, like, generally, but, like, why are you running each day? Why are you racing? Um, you know, things that segment it into more and more answerable questions. And within that context, there's no right answer. Like, basically the only wrong answer for us at least is to say like i want to beat my neighbor i want to beat like a time or anything like that as like these big answers because those are you know what we've seen constantly is crises of existential self that result from essentially thinking there's any end point that will be satisfactory um, so, yeah, that's all a, a roundabout way to get back to the, the hippy-dippy idea of, like, you know, it has to come from within. has to. Um, and what that means in practice can vary a ton. 
Yeah, yeah, and it, it's tough, but I think there is a, a reason to do this, right? Like some people, you know, especially if they're very, uh, not process, but like outcome oriented or, or very like numbers oriented, sometimes they're like, ah, oh, that's just stupid, right? I'm going to win this race or, or whatever. But it, it sort of begs that question of how you get out the door every day, you know, and not just for this first week of training, but for the years, right? And and are you going to enjoy those weeks and months at the end of it all, right? And I think you do. A, yeah. You have a couple of really good examples of you get to that world championships, you're holding that medal, and then like there's a collapse, right? That post Ironman burnout, <laughs> depression, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess that's the big point is that there is no light at the end of the tunnel. There is just more tunnel, <laughs> no matter what you're talking about in life. Well, and, um, and that's where your death thing, like where the book starts, right? Like that's ultimately, I think, why yeah, you yeah. started the book with the death is <laughs> yeah. is because we're all and, dying, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that not only is our, our bodies terminal, but our athletic careers are terminal. Like all these things that, that we do really don't have endpoints. And other than like, a, you know, whatever endpoint is at the very end. And as a, and as a result, like when you when the mental switch flips to think, oh, if once I, you know, I want to achieve this thing, that's great to structure the process as long as there's a long-term focus in mind. But if the goal is just to win a race or whatever, you know, what, what we've seen, I mean, we're fortunate enough to coach some people that have won some of the biggest races out there, is often that's, that's followed by some of the deepest depression and existential crises you've ever imagined. Um, you know, I... Bef- just a, just before swap started, I was very the team summer call play that we coach. I was really lucky to have my own sort of athletic existence. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of the book has to do with you know a lot of the bad stuff is told through Megan and I's prism because we don't want to tell other people's bad stories. We like to tell their successes. But um, you know, I had my athletic um, crisis long before my professional one that came later, but right before swap formed, which was you know, I was coming from football. I was um, just learning how to train. I finally reached the point where I was able to put it all on the line. I spent a summer in Colorado interning at an environmental organization, making no money, staying in a closet, essentially um, training my butt off. Like probably, I don't even know in retrospect because I didn't even run with a watch, but probably like 120 mile weeks, like all of the, like not really focusing on relationships, just trying to get to this the the US 10k champs that August. Um, And so yeah, I get there, you know, on all the pre race previews, I'm not even listed, which makes sense, because I'd never won a race outside of like, where I lived in North Carolina. And then I come out of nowhere, win that race beat the US cross country champion. And not only did it not change anything, it actually like, kind of caused my athletic and personal life to have major struggles. Like, Megan and I's relationship had our, had its only difficulty that we've had. Um, I got overtrained and burnt out and had, it was two years until I got back to that level. Um, and you know, that was all coming from like this, this why that was focused on things that didn't really lead anywhere. Um, so, so yeah, but that story is not unique to me. I'm just telling my story because I don't want to tell someone else's. We've seen that over and over and over again. So we try to stem that like, to stop that before it gets there with everyone. Like, um, you know, we're trying to, like in our very, in our pre-race email, for example, we tell people like, we don't give a F about your race results. <laughs> I'm self-censoring there. Um, you know, we don't care where this leads, that training is the test and racing is the celebration. So training is the process, racing is, you know, the results essentially. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the basic idea is we want to create or we want to help facilitate people to, you know, find their fulfillment long-term and long-term fulfillment is just never going to come from someone telling you you're good enough or whatever. It has to come from you telling yourself you're enough no matter what. I think that's awesome. Yeah. And I think encouraging and and from what I've seen with your coaching, what Molly's told me too, like it's, it's a lot of the enthusiasm is around that daily process, right? And that, I guess the, the daily wins, the daily excitement, versus, you know, that world championships win, right? And would oh, yeah, you agree well, with life, that? Yeah, life is hard as crap. Like, let's start there. Everything is. Um, doing a podcast like you guys are doing right now, so hard. 
Um, that's why I have not done it and am not planning on doing it. Like, well, well you're welcome to come back anytime and you can just... You, <laughs> you, 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 but you are. <laughs> and doing it and building this thing that you guys do. But it's like literally goes for everything in life. Just just the process of, of working through things is not easy. And, you know, everything, there's this whole idea of entropy, which, you know, it scientifically is very complicated, but in like cultural terms, it's often distilled down into this idea that everything falls apart. And that is so true. Like literally everything that you care about becomes room temperature unless heat is added to the system. So think about, you know, you, the podcast, for example, it's all this initiative that you guys had at, at, at some point and you keep putting energy in, energy and energy in, and that's the only reason it continues. But it's not just things like that. It's like long-term relationships. Like the reason that like things like marriages become like lose passion is not that people love each other less. It's just that they affirm it less. They like act on it less. They do all these things that this, they, they spend less energy on it. Um, and the same thing goes for athletics. Like, so what I view my role as, as a coach is to do is to just try to give as much energy as I can to someone that's, that's fighting through this day to day that isn't easy as an athlete um, and give it, give as much as I can to them. So I'll call an athlete out. I'll say things that are, are, you know, like critical when it's needed, but I view my main role as just being there supporting and like injecting some exclamation points into the system because otherwise they're going to get to room temperature with their athletics. And once that happens, like there's no such thing as athletic progression at that point. Um, it can only come from a place of, of passion and, and caring about it over time. So, so yeah, I mean, within that, within that framework, I mean, we do celebrate races. We really celebrate it, but only because it's a convenient checkpoint for this broader process. And we try to celebrate all races equally, whether a person finishes last or first. Um, but I mean, all this stuff is hard, but what I challenge people listening to do is to really try to embody that, that idea of enthusiasm and kindness to yourself in your athletics whether it's like an interval workout or just how you're thinking about it. Because once you do that, you're opening the door to your own potential. But if that box isn't checked, like you'll always be at some fraction of your potential thinking that you're pushing your limits. I really like that. Um, so this is kind of like a weird question and I'm probably going to butcher how I, how I want to oh, say excited. it. Okay. So <laughs> I can't wait. In the, in the book, we talk, it talks a bunch about how you, start to learn that the results aren't really everything and you know they're not even they're really nothing when it comes to the the whole general lifelong love of running and all that but what if you never get the results like if you don't win if you don't podium if you're always in that kind of like last place so you've never like gotten to be at that like high to suddenly realize that it didn't mean anything you've never seen that it doesn't mean anything because you've never been there how do you... And this, this could apply to sort of a master's runner who comes in late yeah. and just never, you know, is busy but running. Yeah, so I think that applies to everything in life. Um, you know, when you think about podcasts, like we're not going to be the number one podcast in the world um, for, right, you know, the, the consummate athlete or whatever, or I'm not going to be the number one writer or whatever. Um, and same thing goes for athletics. You know, one person wins a race, a lot of people finish in the back of the pack and that's those are equally valid things so within that framework i think the big thing is that we all have goals and things that are meaningful to us um and this gets back to the whole idea that to us and and i mean i hope that eventually we can push the community more and more to embrace this idea everyone is an elite athlete we're all striving to achieve our potential within the context of a life that is meaningful to us. So for some people, that potential means that they win Western States 100 or Hard Rock 100 or, you know, the U.S. Championship or a World Championship, like some of the athletes we coach. For other people, the same striving re means that they might finish a race before the cutoff, like by a minute. And there is no inherent value judgment in either of those. And so what we try to do is, like, get athletes to embrace that. And I think we've had some success with that because – the athlete that's trying to finish the cutoff is still chasing, you know, these, their, their long-term potential within the context of their lives. And to them, it's just, it's just as meaningful. I think the, the hard part becomes when people and athletes try to be something that they aren't. 
Um, so, you know, in a professional life that's and has like very clear things, you know, like if, if the, your metric of success in a podcast is getting the same number of listens as Joe Rogan, like, yeah, you're never going to be happy with it, but you don't need to do that to find that your you know, this process is meaningful to you. Um, and understanding that, you know, if you get a hundred more listens on a podcast, and then a hundred fewer when I'm on for obvious reasons, that doesn't change like the value of doing it. Um, so yeah, all, all a long-winded way of saying that there like results or where someone places in a race or where this process leads, that has nothing to do with like the amount that a person gives to it or anything like that. I mean, so much of that is genetics or background or luck, all these other things that go into it. So, you know, it's good, but like it gets back to kind of one of our points about we don't, you know, who I, I understand that magazines have to put people that win races on the on the front cover, and we, you know, as as coaches, we have to kind of advertise our athletes that win big races just to make sure our business doesn't our business can live. But you know, the people that should be on everyone should that that lives this elite athlete life by that just meaning like works their asses off. Sorry works their butts off um it's they allowed all it's be on allowed cover. <laughs> oh it's allowed yes on a technicality um but yeah so i mean that gets a lot of pushback like i wrote an article recently um about that exact topic about you know essentially saying that if you make these choices you are an elite athlete and um you know people push back against that in in some ways so a few, a few people did and i think it's just a different worldview but it's no, no less valid no, I think that athlete identity thing is super important. And I mean, it, it, it's such a shift, right? Like when you can start thinking of yourself as being this elite athlete, you know, it completely changes your mindset, whether or not you're getting the results. Yeah, yeah. And apply that to everything in life. Like, I mean, we're just because like your journey doesn't lead to, you know, the mountaintop no matter what you're doing in life, that doesn't mean it's not a freaking awesome journey. Like we all have the same finish line and the people that are the most successful in almost any avenue in life are often the least happy. And um, that's not because like success brings unhappiness. That's because often the, you know, the choices that you make to strive for those things are not conducive to a long, happy life. Maybe doctor or lawyer being a great example, like a lawyer being a great example. You know, a lot of partners at law firms, reach 55 years old and absolutely hate who they are and what they've done. And that's not to say it's not an amazing thing to do for some people. And it, but like society celebrates that, you know, but why is that more valuable than someone that is a very happy toll booth operator or something like that? So in other words, um, you know, we're all stumbling through this thing. And like, honestly, I don't know if anyone, if anyone has that says they have the answers, including me, you like, I've said this before, but you know, you probably shouldn't trust them with your credit card number um, because they they don't. There are no answers, um, and you know, understanding that, giving yourself the grace to go through that process without having an answer, is the whole idea. Um, so strive your butt off with an understanding that where that striving leads leads doesn't really change anything. I like that. Um... Also, random aside, I remember reading an article about toll booth operators being really happy. I think it's because they have like amazing benefit packages and like retirement plans. Are you serious? Dead serious. That's amazing. I think I must I have read no it when I was like 12 or something, but for some reason it's stuck in my head. <laughs> oh my God. That is incredible. I need to find that. And yeah. like, so I can use that as like an actual example next time. Totally, with science backing totally up. accurate. Um, Although now that all these toll booths are being, you know, automated and easy pass and stuff, it's kind of ruined that a little bit. But nonetheless, 15 <laughs> years ago, this was true. Exactly. Um, They're very happy algorithms. Exactly. Very happy computers. Exactly. Super psyched, um, which actually makes me really happy. I love a happy robot. Um, can't handle yeah. a sad robot. Like, I can't watch Wally. -E. It's It would destroy me. Um, anyway, long <laughs> aside. Um how do you, you wrote about this in the book, but I'd love to hear, you made this decision to be an enthusiastic, positive human being. How do you, how do you keep that positivity going? Because I mean, I can, I can attest to it every day in my, you know, 
in my training, I get to see that super positive, super psyched thing come in and it makes my day. Um, it's made coming back from this knee thing very, just so much better. How do you do that day in and day out? Uh, um, so I guess, I guess maybe, well, first, you know, mental health caveat that we'll probably talk about is that, you know, a lot of these things are, are not choices given your brain chemistry, given people's brain chemistry and not to like judge oneself if you don't fall into that camp. But for people that might have the, have the choice, you know, I challenge everyone listening to be the kindest person that you can possibly be, to lift people up, you, to be the, like being uncool is the coolest thing you can do in modern society and to like really embrace that. So might help a little bit to get back to my background. So before football, I was the big fat kid in school. Um, so I know that those words aren't really, you know, good to use nowadays or anytime, but, um, you know, I was the kid that would go into the pool with a shirt on and practice like the world's saddest wet t-shirt contest, every pool party or whatever. Um, you know, the, I never really spoke. I was just like in my own head and um, that kind of went until I was like in sixth or seventh grade and um, I had found running that summer. And so, you know, through running and through my dad, you know, my dad had encouraged me to like in a really positive way to, to try to do these things. And um, through that, I'd started to like feel a little bit less terrible about myself. Um, but because I spent all that time in my own head as a kid, I really at that point had already like done a little bit too much introspection and saw that, you know, the people that the kids that just like cared and were kind and all these things were meant so much to me and it, it changed my life. And one of them in particular who I haven't talked to probably since eighth grade, I wasn't even friends with this person. Um, she said, I like dropped, she dropped a pencil or something and I went and got it and gave it to her. And she just said something like, thank you, you are so nice, or something like that. And for some reason, I think because of the experience I'd gone through, that just really struck me as something that, like, meant a lot. And so at that point forward, you know, my I tried to make daily goals about, like, living, living that life, like, trying to be as nice and kind as possible um, and lifting other people up whenever I can, not to lift myself up, but because – you know, that whole adding energy to the system thing. So yeah, it was like way too much for a little kid to be thinking about. But yeah, you know, I think that's probably what happens when a little kid suffers from like a little bit of depression. And um, so that became a little bit of a habit over time with the caveat that I was also a total asshole. I can say that word now. I was a total asshole sometimes, <laughs> um, you know, like, like, like all teenagers and all like I still am. Um, it's not like I'm any better than anyone else. I suck often. Um, but the idea is just like trying to, trying to do that for other, you know, for other people, but then also a little bit because it comes back on you. And so fast forward and I met Megan, um, an ice cream shop in a date and she was, she, she saw that behavior and was an extreme skeptic, um, of it though, you know, she was an extremely nice person, but she was just like, she thought that it was fake essentially. Um, and over time, like, if, if, you know, you'll have Megan on the podcast at some point, I imagine and you'll see that she's far more, far better at this stuff now than I am because, and she's like my teacher on it, but she learned that like by doing that, you can really lift others up. And so it matters as a coach, but it matters as no matter what you're doing in life, like you can be the energy in the system for the people around you often. And that'll often, that'll come back on you a lot too. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard, but it becomes a lot more of a habit over time. And if you can do that, like if you can do this for other people, I think what performance psychology is really starting to show is you'll optimize what you're capable of as an athlete. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that those you, we tell athletes that positivity is a performance enhancer because it really, really is. Um, and, you know, living it in your everyday life can probably apply those same sports psychology principles to literally anything you care about. If you haven't already, you need to start listening to Andrew WK. Um, just, just putting that out there. 
Uh, it's it's a band that's pretty much all about positive partying. That's that's actually the hashtag. <laughs> I know. I, think. I remember. Was it party on or whatever the song? Party was, hard. Was like <laughs> party hard. Yeah. No, you better you better believe. I like. I've also listened to some interviews with him. Maybe he's my uh, he's my Confucius. Is Andrew WK? Yeah. I feel like he's like your spirit animal. He's like that's, <laughs> he's literally my favorite person ever in that whole music scene. Um, that's a, well, yeah. One, I mean, I think that that like none of these thoughts, no, no thought that Megan or I have or anything in the book. I mean, we have no wisdom, and we're very clear about that. Like we don't know anything. Um, there, no, nothing is original. It's just like the idea that you know these these I, these things can be applied to your athletic life. So one of the the people we really admire that talks about this stuff a lot is a comedian named Pete Holmes, um, who, you know, before we wrote the book, we had really, we had listened to a lot of his podcasts. You made it weird. And essentially he's like, you know, he really draws home this idea of like, we go around all day withholding affection and not telling people how we really feel. And like, we're making the world so much worse for no reason. Um, so tell someone they're awesome because they are, or whatever word you choose to use. Like, you know, how much of a difference does that make for you? Like, for me, when someone tells me that, it, like, lifts me up so much. And that's the only reason I've been able to reach where I have in life. It's because I was fortunate enough to have people that did that for me. Even people, like, from that um, woman in the seventh grade locker, at the locker in seventh grade, to, like, all these mentors in college and law school, people that I'm not in touch with anymore, but I owe everything to. Um, and understanding that these are not finite resources. It is the ultimate renewable resource. Once you give some out, you just get more to give out. Um, and it makes you better on interval workouts. It makes you better at races. It makes you more kind to yourself too. Um, so yeah, but also as a, the caveat of that is like, give yourself the <laughs> grace to be a jerk sometimes too. And like, be mindful of that, understand where that's coming from and don't never beat yourself up about anything because like, like literally all the other stuff we talked about, it's hard and there are no answers. Um, you know, could be wrong on this one too. No, I think that's, that's great. And on the topic of not beating yourself up and kind of to get a little bit more runner specific, um, one of the, the things I'm working on right now is this article about, you know, uh, basically how to know when or, or when to see that a runner has plateaued and then. I'd love to know how you help a runner get out of a plateau, whether they know that they're in it or not, I guess. Yeah. So athletic progress is the nonlinear interaction of thousands of variables, many of which we don't even have identified in a concrete manner. So in other words, identifying a plateau is often a feeling before it's a number. Um, so, you know, whether it's emotional or whether it's like, seeing that you're not you're getting like objectively slower or something like that um but i think there's a couple things to keep in mind one that athletic progress does, is non is it's essentially a series of peaks and valleys that tr hopefully trend in one direction so plateauing or, or regression is a very common thing, especially with even within training cycles where an athlete goes on to set every personal record they've ever had. Um, so plateauing is a part of this long-term process as long as you have like a method behind what you're doing. Um, the other is that often what we perceive as plateaus is noise and not signal. So we're seeing that, oh, well, you know, you've, uh, your training volume tires or you're coming back from injury or... Um, you know, your body in the process of absorbing the stimuli you've been providing it. Um, so all that being said, the way that you actually break through any plateau or like if it's like a longer term thing is for a runner, I think the, the only way to do it is there, there's two ways to do it. One is if you've never done it, the trial of miles. Um, it's a, that's a line from once a runner, like, a book, a cult classic in running from the 70s, where essentially this, this kid moves to the woods in Florida, runs a crap ton of miles, and eventually wins like an Olympic medal or something at the end. Um, that book has a lot of problems, including, I think, <laughs> probably misogyny and things like that. But it's a, that's a general point that every... <laughs> um, yeah. 
it's a book from the 70s so this happens yeah yeah the misogyny of once a runner could be a uh uh, an article um that i would not have the courage to write (laughs) yeah i would (laughs) not take that one on that's probably it's 2019 (laughs) Um, you can do these things yeah exactly um but yeah so i think every runner that reaches their true potential by true potential i mean this really nebulous thing of like, you know, accomplishing everything they could ever do in the sport has a story about the trial of miles. Um, so it means different things to different people. It doesn't mean you run a hundred miles a week. Um, but it does mean that if you can to increase the amount of aerobic running, you do add doubles, add these, this stress, um, essentially running is a purely aerobic activity in terms of how athletes develop over time. And until you've checked that box of developing that, you're always going to be just scratching the surface of your potential. Um, so the trial of miles is the first way that's for a more advanced athlete for athletes that are maybe a little less advanced or might have be highly injury prone or things like that. The best way to do it is to actually get fast. Um, so many people in running training focus treat it kind of like cycling training. So, you know, in bike training, a lot of it's focused on functional threshold power, which is essentially lactate threshold or like one hour effort. So it varies a lot. So don't hold me to any of that. Um, And that makes sense because biking is not an activity that involves so much of an emphasis on biomechanical efficiency. Um, The machine does the work for you. There is some cycling economy, but it is not something that you need to like do all out sprints to improve quite the same way. And running, meanwhile, so much of it is neuromuscular, biomechanical, all forming this running economy feedback loop. So you need to make faster running, take less energy, rather than practicing going hard. Because if you practice going going hard and you're inefficient, you're just going to get injured and slow down, um, which is kind of the weird thing about running training that you know we tried to really harness with our athletes, including athletes that do 100 miles. So, you know, what I would say to those athletes is to focus on doing very, like, actually learn how to get fast. Um, the prototypical example that, that I've used in the past is to, like, picture a kid running at recess, um, a kid that, you know, has never really run before. Like, but they just run, like, we can all imagine, like, this gazelle running across the playground, essentially. Um, and now picture, you know, a very good runner doing 50 milers that just is like slogging out their everyday run, you know, but like a, a, someone that finishes like 30th at this race, you know, that's a very good athlete that would crush that kid in a longer race. But why do, why are they losing that gazelle like ability? It's because they haven't practiced it. They haven't reinforced these neuromuscular adaptations that come and go very rapidly. So yeah, what we do is add a lot of strides, like short, fast bursts, that teach people to actually go fast. Um, and cool enough, just this past year, a number, a couple different studies came out that really support this approach where just three to four weeks of speed endurance training, which in the study protocols was like six to 10 by 30 seconds fast, two or three times a week mixed with easy running, um, caused people's velocity at VO2 max and velocity at lactate threshold to improve by four to 6%. Um, so even while their VO2 max and lactate threshold didn't improve, their speed improved, their economy improved, which is the ultimate example of breaking out of a plateau. Yeah, I think that that's good. And, and I love in the book, um, sort of like, I guess, relates to, you say, coaches, you know, as, as you get older in coaching and, and more experience, you realize that the training is, is very much secondary, you know, even tertiary behind all these other factors. So I love that the the training program that you sort of lay out, at least the basic one, the the template to start with is is fairly simple. Like it's you just need to run most days, some off days, and then you mentioned sort of adding in a bit of strides and intervals or fast runs eventually. Um, but I really love just the simplicity of that template. Um, so I guess I guess what I'm asking is, it, would would you say that? The, the the key thing that people go wrong on, you mentioned the cycling training, is that they jump in and it's all about 5K TTs and hill intervals and, and things like that. Would, would you say that that's a common misstep you see maybe in the athletes that have come to you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it gets back to, like, who athletes are, you know, very driven people that want to be doing the most work they can. And I think often, as, like, all people – you know, me included, um, substitute 
working hard for like things that actually make you better. So um, a good example would be a lawyer that does 80 to 100 hours a week in the office, thinking that that is what's needed to be a good lawyer. When, you know, all the evidence we have points to that makes you just an inefficient lawyer. Um, And the same goes for other professions and other things like this cult of going hard um, that that, you know, comes from probably a place of insecurity for most people. I know it does for me. Um, so with running, it's like, not only does that like not good psychologically, it's not positive physically until an athlete is extremely far de- well developed and is in like the peaking and building phases of a block, um, whether it's for a race or just to, to get faster. So, you know, th- that gets back to the idea that pretty much everything you do in running should be pretty easy. Like if it's, if it's go, if you're going over aerobic threshold, you're not going to improve. You're going to stagnate very quickly if you don't get injured um, right away. So that means that at least 80, you know, the old 80, 20 rule that people love to throw out, there's no particular like method to that number per se, but the idea that most of your running is just going to be easy. Um, On top of that, you need to learn to run fast. That gets back to these strides and things like that that can be within easy runs. And then intervals are a relatively small part of that because most athletes will reach a large percentage of their potential just by doing reinforcing these fast go fast biomechanics and neuromuscular patterns with the aerobic development from going easy. And then once they do those harder intervals, they'll find that they're way faster than if they just jump in. So, um, you know, lots of examples, but maybe a good one would be Patrick Karen, who doesn't, um, he's a, um, a, a man I started coaching three years ago now, um, and he came in without, he was a, he's a young guy who never had a background in track. Um, and I think that that's one, one problem is that a lot of training methodology is developed from, for and from people that have these very, you know, have run miles and 5Ks on the track and things. Um, so, you know, Patrick Karen did, like, worked I've never seen anyone work as hard as he did. The year before he joined coaching, I think he did 6,000 miles of running or whatever. Um, his workouts were your traditional 2 by 5 k or whatever, and, you know, just like grind out workouts very similar to what you would see on the bike or whatever. And he was very good, but clearly not as fast as he could be. The next year, we decreased the volume a big amount, taught, you know, emphasized running fast. And, you know, he had huge breakthroughs, ran a, I think like a 12 and a half hour, 100 miler, in addition to setting 5k and mile PR and things like that. And then got signed by Solomon. And now we're back to doing those real fast workouts or those longer workouts, like kind of the more grueling ones that I was talking about. And he's doing them, you know, 45 to a minute, 45 seconds to a minute per mile faster, even though he didn't do that in the interim. So essentially it's about like you build these component parts constantly and then, um, you know, reinforce them with like the more grueling stuff. Maybe another example actually that's like topical just, just happened is Zachary or, or Nagos. Um, he ran at Michigan. So he kind of a different thing than um, Patrick Heron, 14 minute 5k guy real fast. Um, he had done like six marathons before he joined coaching like three years ago as well. Um, and his PR was like 222 or something. Um, and what we did is essentially relearned to run fast. He spent probably six months where he was emphasizing the ability to run 100 or 200 meters smooth and quickly, um, and then reinforced those adaptations throughout. And this past year, you know, off that, he ran a 217 marathon, got an Olympic trials qualifier, and won the U.S. 50-mile championships, and, you know, qualified for Team USA. So and he's like, <laughs> that was all strides. Like, he doesn't, it's, it's not anything to do with me. It's just him harnessing, like, actually unlocking his own potential by learning to run fast. So yeah, it gets back to, you know, things don't have to hurt all the time. Like in that goes, not just in running. Yeah. And I was going to say like in cycling too, I mean, whether you look at studies or, or just, you know, whatever, what the pros do, like it, it's really a lot of that steady, you know, I, I hesitate to say easy, but low intensity running um, is still the bulk of it. Right. And it's, I look yeah. at some of these, like the the Strava and the the Zwift. I'm becoming the guy who hates Zwift, so I need oh, to mention geez. this. Um, do, <laughs> do you know what Zwift is? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, like online cycling, basically in your basement. Um, 
And I, I just don't. I don't like he's like a like a gamer or something. Well, I, mean, well, I <laughs> which guess, I guess kind of true. There's Swift. Yeah, it is yeah. gaming. Um, but all that to say, people are just like going hard all the time, and they're not talking to anyone. They're not exploring the outdoors. They're not like I just I couldn't imagine not doing most of my workouts like easy, um, or, or at low intensity. It would just not be yeah. fun, right? Like yeah. I think that I, gets I mean, to the heart of the discussion, right? Like the there should be some enjoyment, some you know, just going out and whatever the why is, whether for me it's adventure, it's, you know, sort of just seeing where my body goes and what works eventually. Right. But, um, if I didn't have those low intensity runs, I definitely would not have continued cycling or running as long as I have. Yeah. Well, I mean, you probably wouldn't have even like (laughs) beyond psychologically. I mean, I imagine you just would have been injured all the time, at least with running. But you probably was cycling too, honestly, right? <laughs> like the, 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 there's still knee pain, there's still back pain, there's still glute tightness. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, that's awesome. That being said, I do think, I do think the running transition is hard for cyclists in particular. Yes, because every cycling, fall we have this rewards, struggle. <laughs> yeah, cycling rewards intervals in a way that running doesn't. Um, so you know, while intensity makes up a small portion. Um, like, you know, there's a reason that most cyclists kind of do similar workouts, like some, you know, those eight by five minutes, two by 20 minutes, that sort of thing. Um, and if a runner did that, they probably would stagnate pretty quickly. Whereas cyclists can do this pretty long term and keep growing. Right. Um, and yeah, so like, it's an interesting dynamic. And I think a lot of cyclists struggle initially because they want to be doing that because they know it works because it does work. It works physiologically in how the aerobic system performs, but it doesn't work neuromuscularly and biomechanically for runners. And imagine there's some in that in cycling where you still, like you probably do one leg drills and, you know, faster, like VO, VVO or VO2 intervals and things like that, but it's just less important. Um, so yeah, yeah. Cycling and running are fast. It's like a fascinating training discussion um, between the two, you know, because the, the runners max out at like, top pro runners max out at 12, 12 hours a week or whatever, usually 12 to 14. And the top cyclists, you know, are doing 30. And um, you, there's a lot of things that work in between this. Yeah, yeah. And there was interesting at Leadville, the guy who won this year, he won. On the bike. No, he, he the won run. the run, but he did quite well in the bike as well. Oh, back to back okay. weeks. Did you see that, David? Yeah, Rob Carr. Um, yeah, yeah. And so he did had a done lot a lot of his training. training. On the bike. Yeah, yeah. So there was like this now, of course, I'm sure in the running community, everyone's wondering if they need to bike more or something. I'm but... excited. This means I could have been Leadville since all I've been able That's to do is 100% what head. that means. <laughs> there we I go. Can... Molly, Molly, I know you're joking, but you can. Like, you seriously can. I'm not joking. Um, this you know, is bad because you're... Peter really wants to go back to Leadville. So now he's going to be like, Molly, we could go. I could do the bike. You could do the run. This will be great. And now <laughs> suddenly I'm at Leadville and <laughs> I love it. Let's just, let's dream long-term because like you're, you know, you're talented and you're on this trajectory of like long-term growth. Who knows where that leads? And that's the most exciting part, you know, is structure. Like, even though we'd say results don't matter, like I really want athletes to dream really big, like dream so big that like you, it makes you giggle a little bit, you know, like that giddy laugh that, that we all have when we're like, I don't know if that's the smart thing. Um, because that's that, what is better to like get you out the door and love the process than this big, scary thing on the, like on the horizon. But, you know, always keep in mind that that big, scary thing is just a means to an end. It's not, it doesn't actually matter in and of itself. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so yeah, let's win Leadville in three years. Yeah, perfect. And I think that's great. The three years great. is awesome. And I think what I, I do the same thing with Leadville for the bike for people. And it's, you know, that's awesome. And we're going to go for this, you know, this goal. But then, you know, what I want you more excited about is, you know, you're going to go out and do some big gravel rides with your friends and you're going to get lost and you're going to, you know, how many, like we have eight months, you know, if it was for this year and you're going to like, think about all those cool adventures um, right. And try and get, and people often will come back and that's how I know it's a su- success. They usually do. Okay. But they come back and they're, they're just like, wow, like this summer was just like amazing, like s- such good rides. Right. Um, and that's, that's so then, then usually they want to sign back up. But <laughs> I love everything you guys like do. Like, 
you know, and it gets back to like none of the ideas in the book being original, you know, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of things that you guys do and others. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a reason I love, love the podcast. Well, the book is amazing. So we definitely recommend it and we're going to get those links out to people. Um, and we're, we're so grateful that you took some time today. I know you have lots of people that you need to be keeping tabs on and stuff who have awesome big goals and stuff. So definitely everyone should follow David on the social medias. That's, uh, look, remind me of your Twitter. I just tweeted at you and now I've forgotten. Runner, <laughs> Runner Rush? Um, Mount, Mountain, Mountain Rush. Rush. I was going to say like a, a joke Twitter there, but uh, <laughs> I decided not to. You have like an alternative joke Twitter that you'd like to share? Oh my God, I would love, my, Megan and I often joke that we wish we had an uncensored Twitter where we could put our thoughts out there like in a totally unvarnished way, but then we're like, we probably wouldn't have a business at that point. So yeah. it's that. Uh, We'll, we'll keep those in our own head. Yeah. So you have that. You have the Addy Dog Instagram, which I highly recommend that everyone follows. Okay. Well, that's like a positive one. That's, that's good. <laughs> um, and then tell everyone yeah. where they can find you and your book and all of that. Um, you can probably Google us. No. So basically our email is all over the internet. Um, swaprunning.com. If you ever have a question of any type, shoot it our way and we'll answer it no matter what, even if, you know, very rapidly if we can. Um, basically we want to try to, you know, support everyone, even if that's not coaching. So any question is great, including like, if you want pictures of Addy dog, um, live action shots of her, like smuggling up against our leg as we tell Molly, she's awesome in her training log. It's very, very helpful on both ends because it means I, I might have a chance of getting a dog and also the positive reinforcement for me while I'm <laughs> kind of rehabbing this I think... stupid knee thing has, like I said, just been so, so helpful. And yeah, it's been amazing. I think I should come back on the podcast and we should just spend an hour convincing, getting, yes. talking about the dog. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just thinking like the, the list of people who are like heavily invested and like, co like we'll get tweets and I'm like, wow, this person is, you know, we know them, some of them pretty well, but like, they're like fairly like Olympians and stuff. And they're like, um, just a uh, support for Molly on the dog topic. And it's like, <laughs> this is what these people are invested in. <laughs> we, we are on a waiting list for anyone listening. We are on a waiting list for a dachshund that will hopefully be part of our lives by next fall. So fingers crossed oh, that's so amazing that and we're gonna have so lots of olympic exciting. and high caliber runner uh, dog sitters yeah. around the world <laughs> <laughs> well exactly. if you're ever in colorado you have someone that wants to have your dog here all the time well, there that's, we go. that's a date and that sounds like a good time thanks so much for tuning into the consummate athlete podcast uh, you can check out my stuff over at theoutdooredit.com or by following me on Instagram and Twitter at Molly J. Herford. And you can check out Peter's coaching, training plans, blogs, all that fun stuff over at smartathlete.ca or by following him on Twitter and Instagram at Peter Glassford. And if you want to support this show and other awesome podcasts, please check out wideanglepodium.com for show info, other podcasts, bonus content and to become a donating member so you can get all of that rad behind the scenes content and help keep shows like this on the air. And lastly, if you're enjoying this podcast and all the information that we're bringing to you every single week, uh, do us a solid and pop into iTunes to leave us a rating and review. It takes you about two seconds. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on your phone and it really helps us out. Thanks so much. And we will see you next week.